Now, today's webinar, again, Association of Menopausal Status with Metabolic Syndrome and Depression, CLSA Baseline Findings. Um, if I can introduce our speakers, Dr. Marie K. Christakis and Dr. Allison Shea. So first, I'll just give you a bit of biographies on these lovely uh, scientists. Uh, Dr. Chris Dacus is an assistant professor of, of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Toronto. She received her medical degree from McMaster University and completed her residency training in <laughs> obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Toronto, followed by a fellowship in menopause and mature women's health. Her clinical interests include menopause, premature ovarian insufficiency, and vulvar diseases. Her research interests include interactions between menopause and obesity, metabolic syndrome, and cardiovascular risk. And Dr. Shea is an, an, is an assistant professor in obstetrics and gynecology at McMaster. She received her medical degree from the University of Ottawa and completed her residency training in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Toronto. Following this, she completed a fellowship in menopause and reproductive mental health her research is focused on mental health during reproductive transitions. So now I will turn it over to our uh, presenters to take it from here. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you for inviting me to do this webinar. I was very excited to be part of this, especially to be invited with my colleague, Dr. Christakis. We trained um, in both residency and fellowship around the same time at University of Toronto. So it's wonderful to be invited to here with her today. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you about a recent uh, publication in the Menopause Journal, Depression, Hormone Therapy, and the Menopause Transition Among Women Age 45 to 64 in the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging Baseline Data. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a part of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, but I also have a cross appointment in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences, uh, where I work with that group closely as well at St. Joseph's Healthcare. I want to acknowledge my co-authors, Dr. Sohel, Gilsing, Mayhew, Griffith, and Reina, who have made this paper possible, and also to acknowledge the CLSA participants for their time and dedication uh, my disclosures include that I've received honorarium from both Pfizer and Biosent. So now this is a particularly interesting time and challenging time to talk about uh, mental health and mental well-being given the current pandemic. We know that mental illness is certainly on the rise in the last six months. We've seen an increase in depression, an increase in anxiety, increase in substance use and overdose, as well as suicide attempts. Um, this is all due in part, as we know, to social, social isolation, the stress due to the pandemic, many financial stresses, job loss, uh, and sometimes the opposite of social isolation, being with uh, too many people in a crowded place, namely working parents at home with their kids. Um, so everybody's happy to have them back at school, but we'll see how long uh, that lasts. And again, that adds to the uncertainty and stress right now. We do know that women are at a higher risk for depression. This is a graph showing the difference between uh, men and women in the incidence of depression that starts to occur after puberty. So after women start menstruating, you can see the top line is women. Uh, there's a two to one ratio in that women are much more affected by depression than men. And you can see a few different peaks uh, in the trend. And one is around the reproductive years, thinking about pregnancy and postpartum. And the second peak, which is actually even higher, is around the menopause transition. So a lot of people don't know this, and a lot of people don't talk about it, is that the incidence of depression and depressive symptoms are actually higher around the menopause transition. It's great that we're hearing a lot more about postpartum depression, but we need to also get the word out um, that women are suffering greatly around this transition and that there are a lot of good treatment options. So the menopause is a normal physiological event, which is, occurs following the final menstrual period, which represents a loss of ovarian follicular function and ovulation itself. The mean age in North America is 51 years, but it can occur earlier for many women. 
Uh, it's demonstrated physiologically by an elevated follicle stimulated hormone or a low or undetectable estradiol level. The definition of menopause is actually one year of amenorrhea, so one year of no periods in women with an intact uterus. There are many bothersome symptoms that come along with the menopause. Uh, the most common being hot flashes and night sweats, which occur about 75% of women. We get changes in mood and depression, changes in sleep, which are partly related to vasomotor symptoms, um, but are also uh, independently related as well, in that many women suffer with sleep disorders even after their vasomotor symptoms are improved. Women experience vaginal dryness, a change in libido, uh, bone loss, and weight gain. Now, I mentioned the average age is 51 in North America, uh, but many women suffer earlier than this. So, an early menopause, by definition, is age 40 to 45 years. And then there is POI, or premature ovarian insufficiency, which means a loss of ovarian function occurring before age 40. The most common reason is idiopathic, which means we don't know. Um, but this is attributed to being uh, autoimmune cause. We are still learning a bit more about that uh, as we speak. There are genetic causes such as Turner syndrome and other trisomies. Now, surgical causes such as uh, those who had their ovaries and uh, uterus removed from cancer or for pain or for endometriosis. Um, chemotherapy or radiation induced, some medications. Um, and other autoimmune diseases can also be associated with an earlier loss of ovarian function. Now, we know that if you have an earlier menopause, there are several health risks that happen, and that's because estrogen um, affects virtually every system in the body. Um, your skin gets drier, uh, your vagina gets drier, your, your hair and your nails become more brittle, um, you have less energy, your sleep is more, more poor, you have hot flashes, but the more serious effects are those um, thinking about your bone and your cardiovascular system. We know that estrogen acts on the bones, and we also know that estrogen um, is a potent vasodilator. So when you get a loss of that estrogen, your cardiovascular system um, really is affected. Now, most of what we know about early menopause, um, we've derived from studies of women who have lost their ovaries at the time of hysterectomy. We do have some some studies on early menopause, but we have much more on those who have lost their ovaries. So this is a very good study done by Walter Rocca and colleagues. This is a Mayo Clinic retrospective study of over 1,600 women. And they looked at um, accumulation of 18 chronic conditions followed for 14 years in women who lost their ovaries before the average age of menopause. They adjusted for other chronic conditions at baseline, um, as well as ethnicity, education, BMI, and smoking. So if you can see here, I want to draw your attention to the top line here, and this is the risk for depression. Orange is overall, um, and those who lost their ovaries from a surgical menopause before age 45 is the blue line. Uh, the brown line is surgical menopause, 45 to 49. You can see there's significant and strong risk factor um, to have a depression at an earlier age if you've lost your ovaries. Um, other significant findings were an increased risk of hyperlipidemia, um, as well as cardiac arrhythmias, coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, asthma, um, as well as some of the other chronic conditions. Now back to mood, we know that uh, anywhere from 15 to 50 percent of women will experience some sort of depression or depressive symptoms during the menopause transition. Uh, studies have shown that up to 30 percent meet the criteria for a major depressive episode, and that would be uh, characterized by the DSM-5 uh, characteristics. Um, the risk of a first episode increases times two during the menopause transition, and a recent meta-analysis showed there was an increased risk overall for depressive symptoms during the perimenopause. So why does this happen? So we know that there are drastic hormonal fluctuations which do affect uh, many of the neurotransmitters that are involved in mood. We also know that women aren't sleeping as well, and so there's a domino effect of that uh, down the line affecting their mood. We know that vasomotor symptoms increase the risk for depressive symptoms um, and have been found to both increase the risk for depressive symptoms and depressive symptoms have also found to increase the risk for vasomotor symptoms. We know women's libido is starting to decrease at this time. This can affect their intimate relationships and then affect their self-esteem. Women are having burnout from taking care of elderly parents and sometimes have uh, children still at home. 
Then there's the phenomenon of the empty nest syndrome. So women are uh, acutely aware of their loss of a role as a, a mother or caregiver at the same time as they are acutely aware that they no longer have a reproductive potential. And this can be particularly damaging for women who do not work outside the home. We know other risk factors include a history of mood or anxiety disorders, but life stressors or any other health issues can put you at a higher risk. Um, now we're learning more that an earlier menopause may put you at a higher risk as well. So the research questions for the CLSA cohort were, what, were the rate, what is the rate of major depression among women participating in the CLSA around the time of the menopause transition? And does an earlier age at menopause increase the risk for depression among women living in Canada during this time? And what other factors increase the risk for depression? So as you're probably familiar, the CLSA is a large national prospective study of more than 50,000 people living in Canada who are between the ages of 45 and 85 at the time of recruitment. There are 11 different data collection sites throughout the country and uh, people are recruited and followed for up to 20 years or until death, whatever occurs first, with assessments every three years. The CLSA is the most comprehensive and deeply phenotyped cohort anywhere in the world and has a multitude of measures, both questionnaires and biospecimen data, which will give us rich data to use moving forward. Uh, the current study, we use baseline data of women with the focus of the age of menopause and the early postmenopausal years from both the comprehensive and the tracking cohort. So even though women were recruited up to age 85, I only focused on the age brackets of 45 to 64 to represent uh, the earlier postmenopausal years rather than thinking about other later life effects that could have a, uh, influence on depression, such as more chronic diseases, um, death of other loved ones around them, and so on and so forth. This gave us a cohort of over 13,000 women to look at. Now, what we did is we exclude women who, undergone, who had undergone hysterectomy because the question posed about hysterectomy did not ask whether or not they had their ovaries taken out. Um, if a woman does have a hysterectomy, but her ovaries are left in, she is not rendered menopausal despite a lack of menstrual period. So given the fact that was not known to keep things clean, we decided to exclude those women. Oh, oh something is not showing up on the side. Anyway, this is the, uh, this is the depression scale that was used, which is the Center for Epidemiological Study Depression, the abbreviated version, which is a 10 item scale. Um, questions were asked such as, I was bothered by things that don't usually bother me, I felt depressed, I felt fearful, uh, I felt uh, lonely, or I was happy. And from this, there's a high sensitivity to estimate a major depressive episode if you score 10 or more. So you use these scores and we uh, divided the cohort for those who scored 10 or more versus those who scored less. And those 10 or more were used as an estimate, estimation of those that were clinically depressed at the time. So what did we find? We found that 18.5% of women in this age group scored as being depressed using this one depression scale. Now this is encouraging because this is actually lower than studies from other countries. Many studies done in the US, uh, in Eastern Europe as well as in China show rates anywhere from 25 to 35% around uh, the early menopause years. So this is somewhat encouraging, but nevertheless, almost 20% of women uh, you know, meet an estimated uh, diagnosis of depression. There were several key differences which emerged between those that were depressed and those that were not. Some of these are not surprising and have been well documented, such as the lower socioeconomic status, lower educational attainment, search certainly are social determinants of health, as well as obesity. Some of this may be due to SES. Some of this may be due to increased inflammation in the body. Um, there were a much higher proportion, a doubling of proportion of those that smoked versus those that did not. Again, this is not surprising. We do see a higher incidence of smokers in uh, women who are suffering from uh, mental illness. Part of this may be is that when you have a cigarette, you actually increase your brain serotonin, your happy chemical, and you get a little jolt of happiness or a little bit of relief from that uh, feeling of unrest. Um, so it's not surprising. Many of these women were childless and they had a significantly less lower tangible social support. 
So even though you have people around you, doesn't mean that they're actually tangibly helping you. So those that if you needed help, if you needed a drive to the doctors, would they help you? Would they be able to get groceries if you needed that? Um, so that's what we mean by tangible social support. We also had significantly less social interaction. So again, you may be around people, but whether or not you're getting affectionate social interaction um, really was found to affect whether or not you felt uh, depressed. Um, part of this may be and due to the fact of uh, being childless. So these are the findings which I think are the most striking findings from the study. What we did is control for age, BMI, SES, uh, smoking and alcohol use, as well as marital status and social support. And we, we found that women who had their menopause before age 40 um, had a significantly higher risk for depression in the midlife years with a odds ratio of 1.45. Now, we had another interesting finding in that those that were currently using hormone replacement therapy, which was only about 10% of the cohort, had a higher risk for depression. I don't think it's the hormone therapy per se. Uh, I think we have to be careful when we see this result. But what I propose is that women who have more severe menopausal symptoms uh, namely vasomotor symptoms, which is the number one indication for hormone therapy, are going to be more likely to have depression. As we know, vasomotor symptoms and depression go hand in hand, and they're a significant independent risk factor. So it's more likely that these women were suffering more greatly in their menopause, so required hormone therapy, and that's why we see this uh, significant effect. So in summary, we found about 18% of women in this, these menopausal and early menopausal years in this representative sample of women living in Canada met the criteria for major depression using the CESD-10. Several social determinants of health were identified. Um, a premature menopause before age 40 had an enduring effect on mental health, significantly increasing the risk for depression. So why is this happening? We do know uh, it has been well documented that a longer exposure to endogenous estrogens may be protective. Um, so this was a systematic review looking at the association between your reproductive period. So if you had an earlier period and or a later menopause, so a longer duration that you were exposed to your own estrogens, you had a significantly reduced risk of being depressed around the uh, early postmenopausal years. So why is this happening? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do know that estrogens influence important neurotransmitters involved in mood regulation, namely serotonin and norepinephrine. When we have uh, estrogen present, it modulates your serotonin neuronal firing, increases serotonin synthesis, it decreases serotonin breakdown. We also know that it has an effect on the noradrenergic or norepinephrine system, increases the availability, and increases the synthesis. So as you can imagine, if women who've had an earlier menopause have a much less time being exposed to their own estrogen, they have much less time uh, to have these positive effects of these neurotransmitters on mood. So what are the implications of this? So certainly proper identification of an early loss of ovarian function may lead to replacement of important hormones, particularly estrogen to mediate this. Hormone therapy has got a bad rap, but it really is often safe to initiate within 10 years of menopause in the right person without contraindications and can have huge health benefits. It will help other systems of the body to reduce health risks. So namely, what we're most worried about in these women um, is osteoporosis and early, early cardiovascular disease, but certainly protection of mental health is very important as well. So what can we do to, to treat these women once they already are depressed? So um, there's a recent CANMAC clinical guideline, which you can refer the, um, the references there. Um, and this goes down all the first and second, third line treatments for depression in a perimenopausal depression. Certainly you want to stop, start by optimizing exercise and sleep. Um, and there are good evidence for several psychotherapies and pharmacotherapy, um, both SNRIs, SSRI, as well as uh, treatment with estrogens. So in terms of future directions, knowing that an earlier menopause is associated with many poor health outcomes, we're now looking at the risk for osteoporosis in women with an earlier menopause in the CLSA cohort, as well as the cardiac disease risk, which is looked at uh, using the carotid intima media thickness. So these will be the next few papers coming out. And we're also going to look at the risk for multimorbidity. Thank you.
Great, thanks so much. Um, I also want to echo how much of a treat it is to be invited to talk here, especially with Dr. Allison Shea, who I've been trained with. Um, I do want to recognize the CLSA for building such a wonderful database for both of us to access, um, and also my co-authors. So I um, work out of the Menopause and Mature Women's Health Clinic at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, and um, my co-investigators included Dr. Lindsay Sheriff, who's at Mount Sinai Hospital, um, and some of our team, our research team uh, at St. Michael's, Dr. Um, D'Souza and Haroon Hassan. So, um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. My, um, you know, my, one of my biggest interests now is on metabolic syndrome and how um, this, how women at menopause are particularly uh, vulnerable to metabolic syndrome and changes. Uh, so we know that metabolic syndrome is a combination of dysmetabolic criteria that includes abdominal obesity, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and insulin resistance. And astoundingly, the estimated prevalence of metabolic syndrome in Canadian women, um, the latest data of which was in 2012 to 2013, was 20% overall. And in women who are certainly postmenopausal in the 60 to 79 um, age range, we see that 38% of them fit criteria for metabolic syndrome. So certainly this is a huge health risk. Um, and the significance of it is that it increases the risk of both heart disease and cancer, which are the two leading causes of death among women. So specifically, we've seen a, up to a 78% greater risk of cardiovascular events and death compared to controls. Um, and more recently, metabolic syndrome has been associated with uh, increased risk of breast cancer development, poor prognostic characteristics, including triple negative hormone receptor status, um, and increased likelihood of recurrence and higher mortality. So certainly if we know that there's this correlation between menopause and metabolic syndrome, uh, it could propose a very important time um, to introduce preventative care. So there has been uh, conflicting evidence regarding the association between metabolic syndrome and menopause. Several cross-sectional studies in Europe and Asia have demonstrated an association, and this is independent of aging. So in a 2008 Korean study of And two women, uh, women were um, looked at, and this was their baseline uh, data, similar to what uh, Dr. Shea and I looked at with the CLSA data. And postmenopausal women had a 2.93 times greater odds of developing metabolic syndrome, even after controlling for age and BMI. We also know that increases in systolic and diastolic blood pressure have been uh, shown to be associated with metabolic syndrome. This is also independent of age and BMI. Um, and the data from the study of women's health across the nation, um, or SWAN, in the United States um, had looked at 949 women, and they reported an association between menopause and development of metabolic syndrome that was independent of aging, uh, but had in fact been uh, altered by how long it had been since menopause. So the timing of menopause may also be important. And that was something that we were hoping that we might um, also look at when we examine the CLSA data. So the contrasting data is from Europe where um, there have been several longitudinal studies showing no significant differences in um, metabolic syndrome, in triglycerides, or HDL levels. 
Um, and so what they had found really was that even though they saw this increase, once you adjusted for age, it disappeared. So we uh, took this opportunity to um, examine a large cohort of Canadian women and see how does this, how do these findings apply to our our um, women in the nation? So we wanted to, uh, you know, gain some demographics on metabolic syndrome. We also, our primary interest was to evaluate whether menopause is an independent risk factor for metabolic syndrome or its components that I previously described. And we wanted to know whether the age of menopause influenced the risk of developing metabolic syndrome. So the last piece was whether hormone therapy uh, influenced the risk of developing metabolic syndrome. And um, this was convenient that this information had been collected as part of the CLSA baseline data. Um, so, similar, this, so our approach was very similar to Dr. Shea and her team's approach. Uh, so, we started off with about 30,000 patients, but of course, eliminated males. Um, and then, because of the exact same reason that Dr. Shea had eliminated patients who underwent hysterectomy, we also did so. Um, Certainly, it would have been inappropriate to include patients who we really could not pin down the age of um, when their ovaries started to decline. So even though we know they weren't bleeding anymore, that, that doesn't give us the information we need when we're looking at uh, hormonal changes and metabolic syndrome. So we also ended up excluding women with a history of cancer or an onset of menopause um, at 40 or less. And this was also because of uncertainty around what their ovarian function had been like if they had undergone chemotherapy or radiation. So our final cohort had 12,611 women. And of those, um, 10,035 had undergone menopause. So, pinning down the definition of metabolic syndrome that we wanted to use is actually a bit trickier than it seems. So, uh, a unified set of criteria were developed in 2009 that resulted from collaborative efforts of the International Diabetes Federation, the American Heart Association, and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. So this set of unified criteria, which is under definition one, has been adopted in Canadian literature, and so we felt that this was the most appropriate starting point. But uh, the unified uh, criteria, when they were developed, they had encouraged a secondary analysis using a lower threshold for waist circumference. And this is because waist circumference is um, very sensitive to ethnicity groups. And so we have this second set of uh, criteria where we used a lower waist circumference, so from 35 to 32 inches, and that's really the difference between definition one and definition two. Um, the other um, piece that we had to modify from the unified criteria is that we used a glycated hemoglobin because this was available in the CLSA data set, but this is also supported in the literature. Um, so, and it's also supported by the American Diabetes Association. So, we, when comparing um, these two groups, the uh, premenopausal and postmenopausal patients, um, of course, we saw that women who were postmenopausal were older. Um, and one one thing that I should point out is that we use standardized uh, differences or D values to report a lot of this data. Because although p-values can 
inform us about whether an effect e exists. Um, it doesn't reveal the size of the effect often. Um, and so this is kind of a newer wave in um, reporting these kinds of um, results. So any standardized difference of greater than uh, 0.1 denotes an important difference. And so um, when we looked at these, when we compared postmenopausal women to premenopausal, we found that they were more likely to be older. Um, they had higher hemoglobin A1Cs, higher triglycerides, higher systolic blood pressure. So no, no real surprises here. But also in this group, in this CLSA group, they were um, less likely to be in a relationship, more likely to have a smoking history, uh, have a lower household income, a lower level of education. They were less likely to be regular drinkers and um, less likely to have reported weight gain in the last six months. And that piece was actually interesting to us as an aside, um, because certainly, um, there is a lot of data surrounding weight gain at menopause. Um, but I think that whenever we're comparing postmenopausal and premenopausal women in any study, um, there certainly are generational variations that we have to be careful about and control for. So the prevalence using definition one, where that's a higher waist circumference, um, overall, 30% of the CLSA participants that we included fit criteria for metabolic syndrome. With definition two, it was higher, um, understandably, because we're including more women, at 35%. So this is actually, um, you know, this is higher than what um, the previous statistics had noted from 2012 to 2013. Um, among postmenopausal women, um, with definition one, it was 32.6% and 38.2% using definition two. So these are, you know, a significant uh, portion of a very large uh, population that had been sampled or are fitting these criteria. So this is very hard to see here, but essentially we looked at the um, the relative risk and we adjusted um, for several factors. Um, so we um, adjusted for body mass index, age, highest level of education, household income, marital status, type of drinker, and type of smoker. Um, and this was based on previous literature and also what we were finding there were significant differences in. Um, and so when we adjusted for all of these uh, variables, we, um, I wanted to point out with the red circles, um, the items that did end up being significant. So there's a summary on the next slide for ease. Um, so postmenopausal women, um, were um, they had a significantly higher relative risk of metabolic syndrome using definition two, so the lower waist circumference, but not using definition one. Um, and this was after adjusting for all of those uh, variables that I had previously listed. They also had a higher risk of impaired glucose tolerance, elevated blood pressure, and elevated triglycerides. So um, we wanted, our next goal was to look at age groups, and I would direct you to the, uh, there, each of the points are in clusters of three, and the, the bottom of each third, every cluster of three is the adjusted relative risk. And all you can see that all of those are crossing um, one. So there, it for in our um, population, we did not see 
that when we broke these women up into uh, when what age they had undergone menopause, it had not impacted whether or not they uh, developed metabolic syndrome. So no significant uh, difference in risk of metabolic syndrome by age group. So the next question was around hormone therapy, menopause hormone therapy, and whether uh, women who were had um, had been on hormone therapy versus women who had never been on hormone therapy, if there were important differences there. Um, and what we saw was that there's really only one uh, difference, and this was that women who had taken hormone therapy had a lower risk of impaired glucose tolerance. Um, now, this, um, this may be um, because the effect of hormone therapy is transient. And based on our data, we could only categorize women as ever users or never users. Um, we couldn't say whether they were currently taking hormone therapy. And so it's very possible that um, you know, the changes that have been substantiated in other literature to um, um, changes in triglycerides, changes in um, HDL, changes in blood pressure for women who are on hormone therapy, that perhaps we were just not at the right time point. Um, so we were limited by the cross-sectional nature. Um, and then this table just breaks down the types of hormone therapy that women were on. And certainly um, the literature on hormone therapy impacting metabolic syndrome is in women who use some form of estrogen, so not progesterone only patients. And so we analyzed this group of patients with and without the progesterone only group, and we found the same, uh, it, it hadn't impacted any. So um, overall, the prevalence of metabolic syndrome um, is 35.1% by definition two. Postmenopausal women have had higher levels of hemoglobin A1C, triglycerides, systolic blood pressure. And we had adjusted for all of these variables and found that um, um, they, that postmenopausal women had a higher risk of impaired glucose tolerance, elevated blood pressure, and elevated triglycerides. And they also had an elevated uh, risk of metabolic syndrome by definition too. So a really important point here is that 96% of the CLSA cohort reported a European origin. So using this ethnically sensitive lower waist circumference value um, gave us the significant, the significantly higher relative risk. Um, and so I do think that this, this is an appropriate um, interpretation of the findings, but certainly the effect size was not large and it disappeared when we used a lower waist circumference. So, um, you know, this is important um, information for people reading our study to know, um, but likely this you know, the criteria, the reason why there's so much conflict over which criteria to use is because it is so sensitive to these small changes. Um, so the age of menopause and use of hormone therapy really did not have any effect on the risk of developing metabolic syndrome. Um, but again, we are limited by the way that uh, data was retrospectively collected regarding the age of menopause um, and also the fact that hormone therapy may produce a transient effect. Um, but of course, that's important to know because if you're looking at patients, if you're, if a patient is wondering, you know, long-term, 
will a short course of hormone therapy be helpful for my longevity? The answer from what we've found is it doesn't change your risk of metabolic syndrome long-term. Um, but of course, perimenopause may be a very important time to institute preventative care to identify patients that are higher risk. Um, and this is especially alongside high obesity rates to improve the health and longevity of Canadian mature women. Um, so I, I really appreciate everyone's time and attention, and I guess now we'll take questions. Thank you both very much for your uh, presentations. I also just wanted to note too that um, we appreciate you coming together to do this. Uh, both of your topics um, seem to to work well very together. Uh, CLSA webinars will often only focus on one topic, but with uh, one core research team. Um, so it was really great that that the both of you could collaborate and share share the findings from two different studies in one webinar. So I think it's it's uh, Greatly appreciated that uh, you you were able to to do this approach with us. So, uh, so before I have a couple of things jotted down, but I always like prefer if, if questions come from the audience, so to speak. Um, and the, we had a question from uh, Jean uh, Jean Lu, um, and I believe it was during yours um, your presentation, Dr. Shea, about comorbidity. Um, so could you maybe speak to that a little bit about when, I think it was when you were presenting the initial results? You may yeah, I thought, I saw that question about comorbidity and I, I wasn't quite sure if that was comorbidity of other mental illnesses. Um, I'm assuming that's what it was. Um, now, the issue is we only had specific um, measures for depression. We didn't have a clinically validated tool for a diagnosis of anxiety or other mental illnesses. Um, in terms of a history of depression and anxiety, we sh certainly showed that those who had a history of depression and anxiety were at a higher risk. Um, but given the fact that we didn't have a clinical tool for the other um, the other mental illnesses or any other comorbidity, we can't. Uh, we can't necessarily comment. It just wasn't included as one of the, one of the measures. Uh, great. And so also just a reminder that uh, you can uh, uh, put your questions into the chat box. Everyone, everyone will be remain muted, but you can all uh, put your questions into the chat box as some, some have been doing already. Um, okay, we have a question from Roberta now. If you had been able to identify those individuals who had undergone menopause due to cancer treatment, how do you think it would have impacted your results? I can say for someone had undergone cancer, uh, sorry, had undergone cancer treatment or had undergone premature ovarian insufficiency or even surgical menopause. I think that it would have, you know, would have been really interesting to look at that group. Of course, we would have had to look at them um, separately because of how young they were and the fact that it was, um, you know, an iatrogenic menopause. Um, but there is certainly data showing that women who undergo iatrogenic menopause at age 40 or less are at higher risk of ischemic heart disease. So I would expect that those women, if we had been able to identify them accurately and report on them accurately, would likely have fit, um, been at higher risk of metabolic syndrome. Um, but I think that, you know, we do already have some data showing us a much harder outcome of ischemic heart disease is, is more likely in those patients if they aren't treated with hormone therapy. And so um, I guess the focus of our, our study became more 
what about these women who are undergoing natural menopause and, and should we be looking out for them um, and identifying them as high risk? I don't know how that would, um, like Dr. Shea, I don't know if you feel if you had more data on earlier patients, how that would have impacted um, your results. Um, well, we didn't exclude those patients. Um, anybody who stopped their period before age 40, whether it be from um, a natural menopause before age 40 or from a surgical or a cancer treatment, um, were all grouped as one. I'm thinking of them all as having a loss of ovarian function at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but stay tuned because we have um, we have permission to look at those early menopause, depending on um, all grouped together and looking at their cardiac intima media thickness. So um, stay tuned and we'll, we'll have a look at those results and maybe we can uh, have a further discussion. Okay, great, thanks. Usually at the end I ask about what, the, uh, what, your, what your next steps or plans are gonna be following this research. Um, so you've already alluded to that a little bit. So maybe I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, just one question I had while we wait to see if anybody else has any other questions, and I, I apologize if it doesn't completely make sense. This isn't one of my, um, obviously, areas of uh, content expertise by any means. But I noticed in um, the first presentation, you seem to be uh, learning more about who the uh, ideal uh, patient would be for hormone, hormone replacement therapy and you seem to have some more insights. And I also thought in, in uh, Dr. Christakis's, you also perhaps are learning more about who that ideal patient might be. I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit and do you see both of your, um, these, th these research uh, studies actually contributing to that or is that something we already know um, and it's not something we don't necessarily need to know more about? Oh, I'll, I'll go with that first. Yeah, I think we certainly, um, this, we need to keep learning and we need to get the word out. 2002, the WHI study came out that um, misconstrued the effects of hormone therapy and you know, made blanket statements that everybody got afraid of hormone therapy. Um, the biggest disservice um, those results did is to women who had an earlier loss of ovarian function before the average age of 51 because um, you cannot be generalized to that, but people still um, Google hormone therapy or hear from their, their mothers or grandmothers about hormone therapy and why it's bad. Um, so certainly those who have lost a normal ovarian function for age 50 certainly should be replaced, provided the, the reason for the loss was not an estrogen-dependent cancer um, and they don't have the other contraindications, which um, usually include a history of stroke, uh, blood clots, um, or significant cardiovascular disease, um, a large majority of women can take them. And the same goes for uh, women in early postmenopausal years in the first 10 years. Um, you know, there, there are a, a very small, much smaller list of contraindications for hormone therapy than there are for the, for the birth control pill. Um, but a lot of family doctors seem to not know that. And so um, Dr. Christakis and I probably get a lot of referrals, but for saying bothersome hot flashes in a smoker or bothersome hot flashes in somebody with high blood pressure. Um, and those aren't certainly um, contraindications. You want to get the blood pressure under control, uh, but smoking is not a contraindication. Um, high blood pressure is not diabetes certainly it's not. Um, and just as a family physician really is just to go and just review those lists because a lot of women are suffering uh, needlessly. I think for us, we uh, certainly one of our future directions is, is looking more into um, how the dose and uh, length of time uh, that a patient is on hormone therapy can impact the cardiovascular risk. I think that it's, um, there is some data um, on this, but longitudinal data is difficult to collect, and, uh, and certainly there is a lot of information still pending. Um, I think there is a suggestion that it, hormone therapy is at least neutral for your cardiovascular health. Um, it, there is evidence that it benefits patients 
um, like Dr. Shane said, who are less than 10 years from their menopausal transition and are less than 60, um, that in fact their, cardi their cardiac event rates are lower. But because the event rates are so small in this group of women because of their age and risk factors anyways, it's hard to know whether that effect is clinically significant. Um, and it's also hard to recommend hormone therapy as a preventative approach for cardiac health. Um, but I think that we're going to, I hope that we're going to learn more um, in the future about uh, how hormone therapy interacts with cardiovascular risk because it is the number one cause of death in Canadian women. Um, and, and so we need to, we need to do better and know more. I think you've also alluded to some, some future areas of research, which is uh, great. Hopefully you both continue in, on those lines as, along with your clinical practices. Um, we maybe we'll just, well, we may have time for a couple more, but we, um, Roberta also asked another question. Is there an interaction between depression and uh, met on, and onset of menopause, particularly earlier menopause from cancer treatment? Uh, would you suge suggest your research would you suggest your research suggest this? Uh, yeah, I don't. We weren't. We didn't um, actually look at the data uh, that Dr. Shea had, like the portion of data that was collected from the CLSA, to look at whether that impacted metabolic syndrome. Like to look at the two of them together. Um, I do think that early menopause. Um, Probably does have a, a big impact on on cardiovascular health, but again, it's it, it was very hard to um, draw appropriate conclusions based on the way that the data was collected with the CLSA cohort. Um, and so, once we have more longitudinal data, we may actually be able to draw more conclusions. Yeah. Um, Certainly, I mean, there is, we do know that there is a connection between depression in general and uh, cardiac disease. Um, we are seeing some emerging interactions. I don't know necessarily between depression and METs, but um, it would be interesting to look at. You know, the both METs and depression, you know, do have inflammatory states. We do know that if you have more inflammation in your body, you're more risk for depression um, through the inflammatory cytokines, and perhaps there could be an interaction that way. Um, I just don't know if it's ever really been looked at. Maybe we should. Perfect. If there's anything good that has come out of this webinar, it's a, a future collaboration. Perfect. Uh, I love it. Um, okay, I don't see any more questions coming up, so I think this is probably, and it's uh, we're right about time, so this is probably a good time to close. If uh, you do have any questions, you can still post them, and uh, we'll have the presenters get back to you with a response. Um, but first of all, thank you again to our presenters. We definitely appreciate your participation in these webinar series, and hopefully we can have you back when you uh, share your, your collaborative research project in the future. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline is uh, quickly approaching, and that's October 7th of 2020. You can visit the CLSA website under data access to review available data, uh, further information, and, and learn about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete the survey located under the polling option. Um, if you don't see it beside the chat button, please click the drop down arrow, and then you should be able to see it. Uh, and stay tuned for our upcoming CLSA webinar, the next one on October 20th, 2020. Um, it will be anticipating new weights in the CLSA, unpacking sampling weights and their use. And Dr. Lauren Griffith, who is the Associate Scientific Director with the CLSA, will be um, the lead on that presentation. And I know that there's been a lot of people who have wanted uh, that topic presented at a webinar. So. Um, we look forward to having talk Dr. Griffith with us, Dr. Griffith with us, um, 
And remember, the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. And we invite you to follow us on Twitter at CLSA underscore ELCV. And thank you again for attending today's presentation. We will see you next month. Thank you.